We have come to the third and the final uh, webinar of the webinar series that we have organized on uh, drug allergies. Um, so I think by now uh, our speaker needs no introduction because he has been uh, doing these uh, lectures uh, for the last mm, two weeks and everyone has been commenting how useful it has been. Um, for the, uh, so this time we are organizing this webinar in collaboration with uh, Sri Lanka College of uh, Pediatricians, Allergy and Immunology Society of Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka College of Surgeons, and Sri Lanka College of Anesthetists. Um, so for the newcomers, uh, the uh, our resource person is Professor Tirumala Krishna. He's the Chair of Allergy, Clinical Immunology and Global Health, Institute of Immunology and Immunotherapy, University of Birmingham. He's also an honorary consultant allergist and immunologist at the University Hospital Birmingham NHS Foundation Trust. Uh, he's head of postgraduate school of pathology, uh, West uh, Midland Health Education, England. And he's also a junk professor at the Department of Pulmonary Medicine at the Christian Medical College, Belo Tamil Nadu, India. Um, so uh, today he will be uh, talking to us on perioperative uh, anaphylaxis, a clinical challenge. So that is the reason why we thought uh, collaboration with the College of Surgeons and the anesthetist would be helpful. So let me invite uh, Professor Krishna to uh, start his presentation. Over to you, Professor Krishna. Anushka, thank you very much indeed for the very kind and generous uh, introduction. Uh, can I just confirm that uh, everyone is able to see me and hear me well? Because there, I just saw a comment in the chat box that someone was not able to hear while you're speaking, Anushka. So please, could you confirm that you are able to hear me? Can someone confirm, please? Yes, thank I you think so all much. The messages we are receiving. Th yeah. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's an absolute honor and uh, pleasure to be here uh, yet again uh, to share some of my experiences with you in the context of uh, perioperative anaphylaxis during general anesthesia, a topic uh, which I have always found quite daunting, challenging and also very close to my heart because, uh, you know, I have uh, been very closely associated uh, with the Regional Drug Allergy Service um, in Birmingham, which we established back in 2005. So what I want to do today really is to uh, bring to you our experience uh, from Birmingham, from UK, and I'm going to use this platform uh, to learn from you as to what your experience might be and maybe together we can see how we can sort of, you know, uh, enhance and uh, improve patient care at both ends. So that's my objective of today's presentation. So uh, let me just uh, share my slides. So uh, uh, I work at the Institute of Immunology and Immunotherapy in University of Birmingham. And I'm also a consultant at University Hospital uh, Birmingham, which is uh, which uh, I'm very proud to say was designated as the World Allergy uh, um, um, Organization Center of Excellence uh, back in 2020. So we are a regional allergy service. Uh, we receive uh, referrals of uh, suspected perioperative anaphylaxis, both from within our trust, which is one of the largest trusts in the country, as well as uh, from the neighboring counties. So we, we probably uh, see about... Uh, uh, three or four cases uh, every month um, with suspected anaphylaxis during anesthesia. So with that brief introduction, uh, what I'm going to do today is to give you a background to set the scene regarding perioperative anaphylaxis, mainly whatever we know about epidemiology in the UK and across the world. I, 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 some of you might have already reviewed uh, the British and other international guidelines, but I thought it's extremely pertinent to share those documents with you uh, so that you can go away and refresh uh, your knowledge uh, regarding some of these international guidelines uh, whilst you are shaping your guidelines in Sri Lanka. And then, uh, you know, we are all clinicians and we'd love to 
hear about some challenging cases. So I thought just to put things into context, into perspective, I will put some cases uh, just to, uh, you know, uh, just for food for thought. And that would really set the scene for what is to come, which is, uh, you know, some of our studies that we have done in the UK, particularly in Birmingham, regarding uh, perioperative anaphylaxis. And then um, I have to mention the National Audit Project 6, which we call as NAP 6, uh, which is uh, conducted by the Association, uh, by the uh, Royal College of Anesthetists uh, about three or four years ago now. And they had some very interesting findings. It's probably one of the largest studies uh, ever done uh, globally uh, in the context of perioperative anaphylaxis. And then uh, I want to wrap it up uh, by talking about uh, what the patient pathway is uh, from the time uh, there's a suspected event uh, to their uh, uh, arrival in our clinic and how we sort them out uh, and, and how we communicate uh, back to the anesthetist and the patient's general physician. And then uh, summarize uh, with some conclusions. So that's what I'm going to do today. So I think it's important, uh, you know, I dare talk about anaphylaxis. We have got anesthetists there, no one better managing anaphylaxis than our anesthetic colleagues. But I think it's important to important that we all speak the same language. When I say speak the same language, we use the word anaphylaxis appropriately. Uh, to that end, the World Allergy Organization published their guidelines uh, regarding the diagnostic criteria for what is and what is not anaphylaxis back in 2011, and that was further revised uh, a few years ago. So essentially, it's it's not rocket science. It is simple, but it is important to standardize the definition. So this event can occur, uh, you know, within minutes. I would say even within seconds uh, to several hours. Actually, that took me by surprise, but but it is true because in some patients it could be a kind of uh, subacute onset. Okay, now. From a from an anesthetic point of view, what you see really is cardiovascular anaphylaxis within seconds, the patient deteriorates and there's severe cardiorespiratory compromise. But purely from an anaphylaxis point of view, uh, when, uh, when we talk anaphylaxis, it's mainly occurring in the community, uh, you know, to foods, to insects, things, etc. So if you take that into the context, then you got to be careful when you define anaphylaxis. So we call what is anaphylaxis? So it means that patients usually present with mucocutaneous symptoms, anything from itching to generalized urticaria, angioedema, but it has to be associated with at least one other system involvement. So usually it's, if it's respiratory, it's upper airway, lower airway involvement or both, okay? Or the patient could present with presyncope or severe hypotensive crisis where they you know, have to lie down, adopt a supine position, or in some patients with severe anaphylaxis, it could lead to other complications uh, with coronary hypoperfusion, cerebral hypoperfusion, leading to uh, the Kunis syndrome, which is myocardial infarction, or uh, you know it could lead to seizures due to cerebral hypoperfusion. That is extreme, but it can happen. Sometimes you can get just mucocutaneous symptoms with GI symptoms, where the patient gets severe abdominal cramps or diarrhea, or in some patients actually, when you have anaphylaxis, they have an abdominal prodrome before other symptoms occur. Now, they're all not of great relevance to the perioperative scenario. As I said, in perioperative scenario, even before you remove the syringe, after induction, the patient's uh, ventilatory pressures might increase. You might see the blood pressure uh, plummeting, uh, alerting the anesthetist uh, to, to revive the patient. So that's the sort of most uh, common presentation that we see uh, during during uh, general anesthesia. So I want you to I, I want to introduce you to the BSACI guidelines, uh, which were published some years ago now, but it is very relevant. I think for me, it's the favorite document, not because I work in the UK, but having reviewed other documents, if you ask me to pick one guideline, which I look more regularly than others, it is the BSACI guideline. And uh, I think it's freely available. Uh, you can download it. And I would really urge you to take a look at it. Now, the Association of Anesthetists of Great Britain and Ireland have also published their guidelines, but is, that is purely from an anesthetist point of view as to what you must be doing when you see a patient with suspected anaphylaxis in the operating theater. So these two guidelines together uh, are quite complementary. Okay, So that is from the UK. That's the UK contribution to the GA anaphylaxis. 
But there are Scandinavian guidelines, which are also very useful. And then there is a, a guideline um, from the European Academy, what we call as the ENDA, European Network of Drug Allergy. So that, that's also quite a useful resource. There are some subtle differences between different guidelines, as you, as you would expect. But I think if you are shaping your own guidelines in Sri Lanka, it's really worthwhile spending some time critically reviewing each of these guidelines. So this, I mean, you know, this is not rocket science. We know that uh, when it occurs in the operating theater, it is a potentially fatal perioperative event that has to be promptly treated. I mean, anaphylaxis has to be promptly treated. And uh, the sooner you administer adrenaline, the better is the clinical outcome. But, you know, it is it is something that our anesthetist colleagues are are very aware of when the blood pressure drops or the ventilator pressure increases um, immediately it springs to their mind is this patient going into anaphylaxis so uh, as i said uh, most uh, reactions that you see in the perioperative scenario are grade 3 and grade 4 reactions where uh, you know patients can very quickly go into uh, cardiac arrest requiring cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So this is uh, really serious when it comes to uh, the operating theater scenario. But equally, it is important that we don't forget the masqueraders or anaphylaxis mimics. Because I have seen patients refer to my clinic with, uh, you know, severe acute bronchospasm that occurs uh, during anesthesia. Usually these patients don't have other telltale manifestations like urticaria or drop in blood pressure. They just go into acute bronchospasm and often it turns out that they've got COPD or asthma that is not particularly well controlled and they've had some difficult intubation. So some manipulation in the upper airways, uh, you know, that uh, could uh, sort of trigger bronchial hyperreactivity and patient goes into acute bronchial uh, spasm. And, and that's something that we need to bear in mind as well. So it's always important that when you're doing elective surgeries, uh, your patient is uh, in the best possible uh, space with respect to their uh, respiratory function and asthma COPD control. And of course, you know, acute hemorrhage that occurs uh, perioperatively or patient can develop an MI, um, you know, independently, nothing related to anaphylaxis, but then that could also mimic uh, anaphylaxis. So I think we just need to uh, keep a broad uh, differential diagnosis until proved otherwise. Now, uh, there's a lot of work done in perioperative anaphylaxis from France and uh, Australia. I think if you look at the old papers, most of them are from France and their own experiences, it occurs in one in 10,000 or one in 20,000 uh, anesthetic procedures. Okay, so that's the kind of epidemiology and the background for you. So what are the risk factors? Can you predict who will and who will not develop perioperative anaphylaxis? I don't think so. But experience suggests that if you had someone, um, you know, uh, undergoing a procedure under your care and who has a previous perioperative event, uh, it could be anaphylaxis or it could be something that was undiagnosed. They've not really referred for further testing. So you need to be careful with such patients. So a previous anaphylaxis is definitely a risk factor for a future anaphylactic episode. And I think partly the reason is because, you know, the tests that we offer for allergy, it, uh, they are good when applied appropriately, but they're not 100%. So there is always that small but real possibility that you might get it wrong. So therefore, a previous anaphylactic episode is a risk factor for a future anaphylactic episode. Now, some of you are aware of mastocytosis. Mastocytosis is usually a benign condition. It is a, a condition where you have excess of mast cells in your bone marrow or in your skin. When it occurs in the skin, we call it urticaria pigmentosa. When it occurs in the bone marrow, we call it systemic mastocytosis. It's usually what is called as indolent systemic mastocytosis, ISM, where you have excess of mast cells. So mast cells, they contain granules which are rich in histamine. So if you've got a very high mast cell burden in your body, it means that when you do have an allergic reaction, these cells are going to pour their uh, vasoactive amines, including histamine, uh, rapidly into your circulation. And not surprisingly, patients with mastocytosis due to huge mast cell burden go into severe uh, anaphylaxis, severe cardiovascular anaphylaxis usually. So you've got to tread very carefully if uh, you're anesthetizing a patient 
with urticaria pigmentosa or mastocytosis because they are an independent risk factor for anaphylaxis. Of course, uh, from a latex allergy point of view, I'm sure you're aware that people who have got indwelling latex catheters for spina bifida or for other conditions, they become sensitized and that could be a reason for uh, latex allergy and in a perioperative scenario due to excessive mucosal exposure to latex, you might go into anaphylaxis. So this is the French experience. As I said, they've done a lot of work, excellent work, I have to say. And here are three papers that are summarized uh, over three decades. Okay, and you can see uh, that, uh, you know, the first uh, set of uh, data was in the 90s and then uh, up to 2000 and then early in the new millennium. Okay, and what I want to draw your attention to here is that up to third of patients who you thoroughly investigate, you're not able to underpin a cause, either because they did have anaphylaxis, but you couldn't identify the culprit, or they did not have anaphylaxis. They had an anaphylaxis mimic, and despite thorough investigations, you could not, uh, you know, you could not underpin a cause. So this is really important to note. So don't get too disheartened, my allergy and immunology colleagues. Uh, you know, when you don't get a clear answer despite thorough investigation, yes, you have to be worried because you're not able to give proper advice to your patient, but that's not unusual. It's also our experience that nearly a third of cases you can't underpin a cause. But what about cases where you are able to identify a cause. What about them then? So the leading cause um, in the initial papers, that has changed more recently. And as you can see, neuromuscular blocking agents in the 90s, 70% of cases. But as you went towards 2000, the antibiotics and latex allergy gradually came into the equation, which meant that the proportion of patients with an MBA declined to 55%. Still, they are leading but you can see that they have declined from 70 to 55%. And then gradually over the years, sensitization to latex has increased uh, to uh, you know higher levels, meaning that you've seen more cases of uh, latex as a culprit of perioperative anaphylaxis. And then you can see the antibiotics have gone up from 2.6 to 14.7%, okay? Now, when you come to the NMBAs, the most common agents that were involved in the 90s were succinamethonium and vecuronium. But as you move towards the early millennium, you can see that succinamethonium was still there, but rocuronium has taken over. And I think it is probably uh, due to the changing uh, prescription patterns with respect to NMBAs uh, that has changed the proportion of NMBAs uh, that, that are implicated in the context of perioperative anaphylaxis. So, you know, one of the key things, you know, in medicine, I'm sure you will agree with me, uh, is history. But you can't expect a patient to give you history in the context of perioperative anaphylaxis because, you know, they are under anesthesia. So we have to rely on our anesthetic colleagues, okay? And really, to get a clear account of what has happened is critical if you want to get a high yield with your diagnosis. Okay, which means that you need to have a clear record of what medications were given, how they were given, that means which route, what time they were given, and what is their temporal association with the onset of symptoms. I think if you get this right, that means that you need to work very collaboratively with your anesthetic colleagues. Okay, and we'll talk about that later during the presentation. But if you get that right, then it's very, it really helps the cause. I'll tell you why. If the anaphylactic reaction or the suspected event has occurred soon after induction, then you know that it has to be uh, one or more of the drugs that are given at induction because you're giving it all IV and therefore the reaction should occur immediately. Let us say that about half an hour has elapsed. It's a long procedure. 45 minutes have elapsed. The patient was okay at induction or soon after induction, but sometime later during the perioperative phase, the patient develops anaphylaxis. So those cases are more likely to be related to, uh, you know, uh, NSAIDs that were given towards the end of the procedure for pain control or uh, for, uh, you know, opiates or uh, colloids uh, or uh, uh, latex. Okay, those are the, uh, or, or chlorhexidine. Those are the uh, culprits when symptoms occur a bit later. 
And again, when it happens in the recovery room, after the patient has nearly left or has left the operating theater, then you see the extreme right. So those are the likely agents. So really, if you, you know, it's more of a detective work here, isn't it? If you had that information, then you analyze the information carefully. But if you didn't have the information, you will struggle. So that's why it's very important that you work collaboratively. Um, when I say you, I mean colleagues in allergy and immunology work collaboratively with our colleagues in anesthesia. Okay. So what are the usual manifestations? As I said to you, the most frequent manifestation is grade three or grade four anaphylaxis where patients develop acute hypotensive crisis and it may or may not be associated with lower airway involvement. But usually you don't see mucocutaneous signs. There are two couple of reasons for that, I think. One is because the patient is draped. Our anesthetist colleagues are, uh, you know, are busy uh, trying to revive the patient. And therefore, they may not, uh, you know, they may not have identified the mucocutaneous manifestation or because it's all occurring so rapidly, there's not been enough time for the mucocutaneous manifestations to appear. So it's usually cardiac or cardiorespiratory. OK, so that's the most frequent clinical manifestation. So what do you do then? So, of course, you have to identify the reaction immediately and uh, you have to treat it. As per merits and uh, administration of adrenaline is key uh, for a positive response alongside other supportive treatment. I'm not going into those details now because our anesthetist colleagues are best possibly placed uh, to talk about uh, the acute treatment. But what do you do? Once you have stabilized the patient, the first thing you would do is to take a sample for acute serum tryptase measurement. This is really, really important. And you need to time the sample and you need to document what time the sample was taken. Okay. And then this is the British guideline. You take a second sample one to two hours after the first sample has been taken. And then you take the third sample 24 hours or later, which is a baseline sample. Okay. So by doing this, what is called a serial serum tryptase measurement, one can look at the kinetics of tryptase in the peripheral blood and you can then uh, sort of, it just sort of supports, it complements your diagnostic uh, pathway really. Because if you had a significantly elevated serum cryptase, then it has to be anaphylaxis. It can't be anything else. It has got highly, it's very, very highly specific. And therefore, if you had the time measurements, that just helps the allergist when they are doing their skin tests and making the final uh, uh, conclusion regarding what has happened, then, then it will be very handy. So that is one of the responsibilities of the anesthetist to ensure that those strip test samples are taken. So once the patient has recovered, um, obviously uh, they have to be referred to the allergy clinic uh, along with all the relevant information, including uh, the anesthetic charts, a clear accurate record of what has happened, preferably with a narrative, uh, and, and the trip test results. So this is the kind of bundle or a package that we expect from our anesthetic colleagues before the patient arrives in the clinic. Okay, now I'm just going to introduce you to uh, what is called as the Association of Anesthetists of Great Britain and Ireland Proforma. Okay, so I'm just going to shift to another document. So I'm going to go back to the uh, other mode now. So just uh, confirm that you are able to see this. Can you can you see this uh, document? Can someone? Yes, we can. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the AAGBI proforma that was put together by the Royal College of Anesthetists following the NAP6 uh, audit, okay, or the National Audit Project audit. So it's a three-page proforma, which has to be typed. It has should not be handwritten, and we don't actually accept any referrals uh, in our clinic if we did not receive a duly completed AAGBI performa, and you will see clearly why it has to be typewritten because sometimes, you know, we can't decipher what people's handwriting, etc. So it has to be clearly typed. It's very easy to do. The first page is all about the patient uh, demographics and the referral details, etc. We ask the question, is the surgery completed? Is the surgery urgent? And then the real thing comes here. So what were the drugs that were given? What time, what route? Any comments? And then clinical features, what were the clinical features uh, and what time did they appear and disappear? Okay. Excuse and then we can you only have... see the first page. Sorry. Sure. We can only see the first page. Okay. Maybe I just uh, moved it uh, too soon. One second. 
So can you see this? Now, this is the... Um, I don't think so. Okay, okay, one second. Let me... I don't know why you're not... Uh, but you can see the first page still on the screen, right? Uh, the one that says an uh, anesthetic anaphylaxis referral form, yes. Okay. So what should I do then? Um, I think if you can just talk us through it. Uh, maybe. Okay, so the second page is about the list of drugs administered, uh, the time of the drug, how it was administered and any comments from the anesthetist. And there's a separate table regarding clinical features and what time the clinical features appeared and if they, pay, and if they want to comment. For example, what was the lowest blood pressure? What was the lowest SpO2? What were the ventilatory pressures? Did the patient have urticaria and angioedema? Okay, so that's the second page. The third page is about uh, did the patient have any neuroaxial blockade? Was it spinal, epidural? etc any peripheral nerve blockade what drugs were given then was a patient exposed to latex was a patient exposed to chlorhexidine via a skin preparation or via a lubricant gel and if so what time and then what were the drugs and iv fluids given to treat the reaction and was cpr required uh, were there any adverse sequelae from the resuscitation process and the last page talks about the serial serum triptase measurement, what's time and date each sample was taken along with the test result. And there are a couple of letters at the end uh, which talk about letter to the patient following the anaphylactic procedure. So they are aware that they have had anaphylaxis and they are awaiting further investigations and what are the things that they should be avoiding until advised further from the allergist. And 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 so, so, so that's the sort of... Uh, um, uh, and then there are a couple of letters to the patient's GP along similar lines, okay? So this can be, if you just type AGBI Proforma uh, on Google, you should be able to download this, okay? It's freely available. So I think it's really important that um, that you take a look at that, okay? Can you see the, can you see the PowerPoint again? Yes, we can. Okay, so... So I'm just going to continue with my PowerPoint presentation now. So, so this is what we are expecting. We are expecting a, a, a duly completed type A GBI proforma, along with the anesthetic charts, along with the drug charts, along with a narrative of the event from the anesthetist, and uh, you know, uh, with the trip test results. Okay. So once we get this bundle, that's when we accept the referral. The referrals are not accepted if one or two of these documents are missing, and we would like our anesthetic colleagues to clearly indicate whether the referral is urgent. We always give, um, you know, um, priority, high priority to patients with cancer or aortic aneurysm or any other important uh, life-saving surgery. So those patients are clearly prioritized. So unless we know, you know, we will not be able to do that. But that's all, that all can be captured in the AGBI uh, pro forma, okay? So, why am I banging on the timing of the triptase sample? That's because this tells you the kinetics of serum triptase, okay? The triptase has got a half-life of about two hours, and you can see that it peaks uh, between uh, half an hour to about 60 minutes or 90 minutes, um, and then the levels decline. So if you are able to get serial measurements, then you can actually see what the patient's baseline level is, and what was the acute peak? And by then, you can actually determine whether or not there's been an acute rise in triptase. And as I said, when triptase is elevated, it's definitely anaphylaxis. It can't be anything else. Okay? So, the BSACI guideline also clearly um, delineates what the role of the anesthetist is and what the role of the allergist is. And some of it I've already, uh, you know, um, uh, described. Uh, that includes treatment of anaphylaxis, of course, taking the timed uh, triptase samples, notifying the patient regarding uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the event uh, because they are not aware, and uh, referring them to the allergist. And uh, we usually have a lead anesthetist uh, for allergy in our trust, so they have to be notified as well. We, they have to put an allergy record in the patient's uh, hospital um, you know, records and communicate that to the GP as well. And that has to be further revised once the allergy investigations have been completed. 
in the in the uk we have the mhra which is a regulatory body who have to be informed uh, uh, about the event as well so once the allergist has received the referral they will review the document they will conduct the relevant tests they will liaise with the anesthetist and then once all the tests have been completed we'll counsel the patient we issue a letter whom it may concern letter to the patient so that they can keep a record of it uh, that has to be in a very simple language so anyone can understand what's going on and then we update the records both in the hospital and in primary care and then um, write back to the anesthetist to the surgeon and the gp regarding the outcome of the investigations and we copy the letter to the patient so that's the pathway so this is my first case uh, this is a patient uh, who tolerated uh, general anesthesia previously uh, they reported some adverse reaction to tramadol they are clinically tolerant to aspirin nsaids latex and chlorhexidine they got mild asthma very mild they got allergic rhinitis but nothing otherwise okay so that's the and and nephrotic syndrome that's the past medical history of the patient so this patient uh, had uh, free drugs at in induction fentanyl propofol atracurium all given at 10:30 okay and then at about soon after the induction they became very wheezy uh, lower airway involvement bronchospasm there's no desaturation and the anesthetist noted mild urticaria at the site of cannula and the top of the chest but there was no uh, cardiovascular compromise in this patient okay but so they treated the 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 episode and the surgery was completed all right and then they were referred to the clinic so as you can see here this patient's tryptase did not change at all not significantly anyway you can see the acute and the next measurement and the baseline measurement not 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 a significant increase at all so you know can you exclude anaphylaxis on that basis you will find out soon so we did skin tests both the prick test and intradermal testing the prick tests were all negative the intradermal test was clearly positive to atracurium okay and in fact after the atracurium skin test the patient developed urticaria more urticaria than they had developed during the anaphylactic episode okay and then so we confirmed that the uh, the uh, reaction was type 1 hypersensitivity the culprit was atracurium so the question we then asked is what should the patient have for future surgery so we tested the patient for rocuronium succinium and vecuronium which were clearly negative so we got an answer as well so we found out what is a culprit and we found out safe alternatives okay so we wrote back uh, we, uh to uh, the anesthetist to say that the patient had ig mediated allergy to atracurium and we always put that caveat avoid general anesthesia as far as possible and the reason i also described at the top of my presentation that these tests cannot be 100% so if you can do something under regional there's always a better option but if anesthesia is required then cautiously proceed with the alternatives and in this case we suggested rocuronium and we provided the patient with an alert bracelet that they are allergic to atracurium okay so that's my first case the second case is uh, a patient um, who developed uh, uh, itchy blotches and swelling following a urethral stent procedure uh, 13 years ago uh, the, those details were not available to us okay and also the patient developed a mild uh, urticaria Uh, after using a pink mouthwash at the dentist okay and that should have alerted people regarding chlorhexidine allergy okay they are clinically tolerant to latex they are tolerant to aspirin and nsaids and they have hypertension on an ace inhibitor okay that's the sort of background of this patient so they had multiple drugs at induction you can see fentanyl propofol atracurium comoxiclav dexamethasone cyclizine and so that's all given at about 5:40 pm you can see 5:40 to 5:45 pm and then they had towards the end of surgery they had diclofenac they, they were exposed to latex throughout and just before the surgery was completed at 1755 they had a urethral catheterization and during that procedure a lubricant called instilla gel was used which contains lignocaine and chlorhexidine okay and all this will be captured in the agbi proforma if it is properly completed okay so here is a patient who developed anaphylaxis towards the end of the procedure 
Okay, so it should straight away, uh, you know, you should think about is this NSAID, is this latex or is this uh, chlorhexidine, okay? So the patient was successfully treated. In fact, they were re-exposed to atracurium uh, after the reaction because they needed an additional dose and, uh, and, and they were fine. So this patient at about uh, 10 past 6, okay, that is, uh, you know, almost, uh, uh, what, uh, uh, half an hour uh, later, they developed acute hypotension, tachycardia, bronchospasm, so proper anaphylaxis with urticaria, all right? So here you can see the acute serum tryptase was 18.9, okay? And then the next level was 19.5, slight increase, and then the baseline was 2.7. So clearly the patient had elevated acute serum tryptase, okay? So this is definitely anaphylaxis. It is nothing else, okay? So usually what we know from our experience is when the acute serum tryptase is elevated, you usually get a, you are able to underpin a cause, okay? So in this patient, we we uh, skin tested them to uh, uh, to the suspected drugs, and then uh, it turned out that they had a strongly positive serum specific IgE or an allergy antibody to chlorhexidine, and and we gave them advice regarding chlorhexidine avoidance. Now, one thing I would like to mention here is that chlorhexidine can be present in lots of antiseptics, in mouthwashes, in toothpaste. But very importantly, please note this. This is really important. Some central venous cannula, central lines, can be impregnated with chlorhexidine. And sometimes it's very easy to miss that. And I have known patients who had severe anaphylaxis and even fatal anaphylaxis. Uh, you know, there are some case reports out there that they were accidentally exposed to chlorhexidine despite knowing that they were allergic to chlorhexidine. So this is very important. Please make a note of this so that your patient is not accidentally exposed to chlorhexidine. So this is uh, my final case. It's a 66-year-old gentleman uh, posted for an arthroscopic shoulder decompression procedure. Uh, they've got quite a complex medical history with CABG, type 2 diabetes, uh, total knee replacement. They're on multiple drugs. They've tolerated general anesthesia previously, no problem. They're clinically tolerant to paracetamol, latex, they're smoker. So, and, you know, nothing else. Uh, they had no uh, cutaneous uh, signs for mastocytosis or any underlying hematological condition. Okay, so that's the background. So this patient had multiple drugs. You can see at 835, they were inducted with uh, propofol. They were exposed to lignocaine. They were exposed to alfentanyl, atracurium dexamethasone, metaclopropamide, granicetron, flucloxacillin, gentamicin, the whole gamut of drugs given at 835, multiple one after the other, as you would see in an induction during general anesthesia. Then about an hour later, so perioperative phase was absolutely uneventful. Okay, so they did not have perioperative anaphylaxis. So straight away, you can, you can sort of exclude those drugs because an hour has elapsed. But towards the end of the procedure, 9.35, they were given morphine and diclofenac. And what happened then? They had severe hypotensive crisis, okay? And they, re they actually had refractory anaphylaxis. So they were given multiple doses of adrenaline to stabilize, okay? So you can see that the hypotension first occurred at 9.55. So that's almost more than an hour after induction has taken place. So none of those induction drugs are involved. So I think, you know, if I had seen that, yeah, this, uh, just the data without testing, I would put my money on a diclofenac. Okay, so they were revived. And immediately, when someone develops such a severe hypotensive crisis, you would think of an underlying risk factor. And in this case, we thought of a risk factor. I asked the question, does this patient have mastocytosis? Okay, so if you look at the tryptase measurement, the acute measurement was more than 200, more than the detection, upper detection limit of the analyzer. Okay, and the baseline was slightly elevated. Our cutoff is about 12. So even the baseline level after they fully recovered was slightly elevated. So that made us think about, does this patient have mastocytosis? So they had a bone marrow. Uh, which showed features that were highly suspicious of systemic mastocytosis, although at that time they did not meet all the major and minor criteria for as laid down by WHO. 
But we, uh, from our point of view, this patient had systemic mastocytosis and we gave all the advice relevant to systemic mastocytosis as well. Okay, so here is a patient who developed anaphylaxis to diclofenac. And by the way, diclofenac causes anaphylaxis in a different way from all the other drugs like NMBA, latex chlorhexidine. It, it does not involve the IgE antibody. So we call it a non-IgE mediated anaphylaxis, which means that skin tests are pretty much useless in investigation. It has to be a clinical diagnosis. The only way you can confirm definitively that the patients are allergic to diclofenac is to give them diclofenac again, which I'm sure you would not because they had such severe refractory anaphylaxis. So here it is on the basis of a clinical judgment, having excluded other drugs and having known that this patient has got systemic mastocytosis. Okay, so this patient had two diagnoses at the end of the uh, assessment. One, the NSAID induced event, and then we confirmed that they had an underlying clonal mast cell disorder. So this is, uh, uh, I'll wrap up with a few more slides. Uh, this is the first multi-center study that we conducted in the UK. This is more than about 10 years ago involving five centers. And I want to show you some data from that. So in this study, we looked at 161 patients. And just as I sh showed in the French data, we confirmed a cause in 70% of cases and 30% of cases, despite thorough investigation, no cause was detected. And amongst the patients where the cause was detected, 64% were IgE mediated. That means we had a positive allergy test and 6% were like the diclofenac or morphine, which is non-IgE mediated. And then in our experience, the leading cause again was NMBA. So this is 10 years ago, followed by antibiotics. And then what we, for the first time described, there were isolated case reports of chlorhexidine and patent blue. But in our cohort, we found that 5% of the cases were due to chlorhexidine and 6% were due to patent blue dye that is used for sentinel lymph node mapping in breast cancer surgery. So we call them as neoallergens because they were not actually described properly in the context of perioperative anaphylaxis. And you can see the importance of identifying this. Now with patent blue dye, this can cause refractory anaphylaxis. And usually the uh, latency is about 20 minutes after the intradermal injection. Our anesthetist colleagues might know, our surgical colleagues might know. You give it intradermally for lymph node mapping. And about 20 minutes later, when you think that the patient and you're just about to complete the procedure, the patient goes into severe anaphylaxis and they're not responding. Okay, so you have to think about patent blue dye. If that has been, you know, uh, if that was uh, uh, something that was uh, administered to the patient. And in our experience, you can see uh, the leading cause was atricurium among the NMBAs, followed by rocurinum, and that just reflects the local uh, practice of the anesthetist with respect to use of atricurium and, and rocuronium. Okay. Now, if you look at the clinical features, like I said, uh, grade three, grade four reactions. A lot of them were grade three. Grade four is when you go into cardiac arrest. Okay, so th those were the most frequent clinical manifestations of our cohort. Now, we, we then looked at the tryptase measurement. And one thing I would like to point out for our allergy and immunology colleagues here is that the level of tryptase is very high in IgE-mediated anaphylaxis. It is elevated in non-IgE-mediated, but there's a significant difference. You can see that there's a 603% increase in IgE mediated anaphylaxis versus 157% in non IgE mediated anaphylaxis. I don't know the reason for that, but that's just an important observation that we made in our cohort. This was followed by another study a few years later. And here uh, we did exactly the same thing, but on this occasion, it was just from Birmingham. And you can see here that. Uh, you know, we could not detect a cause in about 17% in our second series. Obviously, we are more experienced in, in our approach. So maybe that would have contributed. And obviously, the sample size is relatively less. So that might have skewed the percentage. But you can still see that there's a proportion of patients where you can't identify a cause. And amongst those where we did identify a cause in the second cohort, antibiotics, particularly penicillin, was the leading cause. And you can see followed by an MBAs, but the chlorhexidine and patent blue are still there, 8% and 8%. So just beware of chlorhexidine and patent blue, okay? Now, what we then did was we looked at the comparison between 
patients uh, who did not have anaphylaxis after thorough investigation and those who had a, a, a culprit identified. And you can see here that the tryptase is more likely to be elevated in patients with, uh, sorry, uh, you're more likely to detect a cause in patients with an acute elevated serum tryptase measurement. So a rise in serum tryptase during anaphylaxis, uh, it, it increases, it, it has a very high positive predictive value for um, for a positive allergy test uh, done by an allergist. So, so really, I get quite worried if I have a patient who has an acute serum tryptase elevated, but we are not able to uh, you know, come up with a cause. And in my own experience, more than nine out of 10 patients, we can find a cause when acute serum tryptase is elevated. So that could be something like a, uh, like a checking point for our allergy colleagues when they're investigation, investigating patients. Now, this is uh, from the uh, AAGBI experience, the NAP6 uh, audit. And this is one of the largest studies done internationally. It involved uh, uh, all patients who un underwent anesthesia G GA in the UK for a year. So 3 million anesthetic procedures were done. And all of them were monitored. And the incidence of perioperative anaphylaxis was 1 in 10,000. Very similar to what was reported uh, by uh, the French group. Uh, back in the 90s. And what we found was uh, in the UK experience, antibiotics, particularly penicillin, were almost half of the cases, followed by uh, NMBAs. And as you can see here on that list, 0.3, uh, 9% uh, uh, of cases were due to chlorhexidine and 5% was due to patent blue dye that was used in breast cancer surgery. Another important point I want to point out to our microbiology colleagues and anesthesia colleagues is that when you have a patient pencil allergy, uh, at least in the UK, tycoplane is used for perioperative uh, prophyl the surgical prophylaxis. And tycoplane is a very allergenic antibiotic and it increases the risk of anaphylaxis by 17 fold. So I think where possible, try to delabel your patient with a spurious uh, pencil allergy label so they are not exposed to tycoplane. So that's one of the take home messages for you today. So, you know, tycoplanin, just beware that the risk of anaphylaxis is very high when you use tycoplanin. That is in comparison to the other drugs, other antibiotics, of course. So this is, uh, so that's about 17.4 relative risk. Now, if you look at all the antibiotics on the chart, you can see the relative risk of tycoplanin in causing perioperative anaphylaxis is very high, even higher than penicillin. Okay, comoxiclav. So that's uh, one of the take-home messages for you today. So what's the referral pathway in the U in in uh, in Birmingham? You treat the acute episode. You take serial serum tryptase measurements as per protocol. The anesthetist completes the AGBI pro forma and forwards the charts with a covering letter, which is a narrative. The patient is offered an appointment, and we have a very special system in Birmingham. We have a joint allergy clinic, which means that. Uh, a consultant allergist does this clinic with an anesthetist on board. And I find this really helpful because in those 30% of cases where you can't find a cause, the anesthetist colleague really helps us in understanding and thinking about other masqueraders or other anaphylactic mimics. And actually, it's a, it's a very uh, good collaborative effort here because I have learned an awful lot from my anesthetic consultant, and I hope that they have also learned something from an allergy viewpoint view from us, and the patient gets the best possible care. And then we produce a detailed report, and that's a joint letter uh, with the anesthetist, so that whatever we put in the letter in terms of recommendation is well received by our anesthetic colleagues, because if you didn't have an anesthetist on board, you might say things that may not be particularly meaningful from an anesthesia point of view. So it's really important to have that kind of collaborative uh, association. Then, of course, patient is fully counseled. They are provided with a medical alert bracelet and their hospital records are updated and we uh, uh, communicate the event to our regulatory body, MHRA, so that we have a national database regarding such adverse events. So to summarize, all patients with perioperative anaphylaxis should be referred to the allergy clinic for further investigations. Antibiotics are the leading cause of perioperative anaphylaxis in the UK, followed by NMBAs. 
One point I didn't make during the presentation, you would have seen from the UK experience, we hardly had any cases of latex allergy. And the reason for that is probably because latex has been removed from the routine clinical environment. Um, so the risk of sensitization has remarkably reduced over the last couple of decades, at least in the UK. It may be very different in other countries. And in our experience, chlorhexidine and patent blue dye are emerging newer allergens. So one must be beware of that. And also all the other things that I described regarding chlorhexidine and plate in blue dye. Serum, serum tryptase, um, when it's elevated, is uh, got a very high specificity and positive predictive value for Ig immediate anaphylaxis. But also equally, mind you, there are a few patients with anaphylaxis where the tryptase may not be elevated. I can't give you a reason for that, but don't dismiss that it is not anaphylaxis just because the tryptase was not elevated. Okay, and of course, uh, good clinical practice, take tryptase measurements and complete the AAGBI proforma. I would like to thank uh, my colleagues at University Hospital Birmingham. I would like to thank my anesthetist, Dr. Hulur, uh, who is an allergy lead at our trust, who made a great contribution to our service. And of course, all the uh, anesthetic departments in and around Birmingham uh, who have been referring patients to us without whom we wouldn't have gathered this experience and learned from our patients. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor TK, uh, for that interesting presentation. Um, so uh, thank you uh, for introducing us to the AGVI performer as well, because a uh, problem faced by many of us is that when we get referrals, we don't get enough details regarding what happened to the patient. And it's very difficult to, uh, if there has been an interval since the incident, then it's very difficult to trace the, uh, uh, whatever the documents. And sometimes it's almost impossible to uh, sort out the uh, problem for the patient. Um, so I think we will have a look at this proforma and probably try to adapt it uh, to Sri Lanka as well, uh, because I'm sure that will be very helpful. Um, we have a few questions, uh, if you have time to answer. Yeah, so uh, one question I wanted to ask was, how sensitive is uh, serum tryptase when it comes to uh, confirming anaphylaxis, perioperative anaphylaxis in the sense if it's negative, uh, can we attribute it to another cause uh, of uh, another reaction, like you said, bronchospasms probably, or um, is it still could it still be anaphylaxis? Okay, so one thing that I didn't talk about in the presentation was looking at uh, uh, tryptase at a greater depth. Uh, we have done a lot of work on tryptase over the recent years, and uh, I would like to mention about what is called as the international. Um, 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 the, the, the consensus equation regarding tryptase. I, you may or may not be avail, uh, aware of that. Uh, this is proposed by Professor Valent uh, and his uh, group um, uh, some years ago, and we were the first group to validate it. So there is a, the question that you ask yourself is, what is a significant elevation in serum tryptase? So this has been a very, uh, you know, a interesting question over the years. Some people look at the absolute values and some people look at the percentage change. So um, there is a publication in Allergy uh, where we did exactly that. We looked at what is the, we, we did what is called as a rock curve, which is the receiver operative characteristic curve. And we determined the sensitivity, specificity, positive and negative predictive value of tryptase at different cutoffs. And we actually validated that equation, uh, which is, uh, a 20%, uh, I can't remember the equation now, but you will find it in the literature. Uh, I can forward you uh, the link. Um, and essentially, uh, there is an equation that you can apply in your routine clinical practice uh, to see if you had the baseline measurement and if you had the acute peak level, you can actually put it in the equation. If it is more than a certain threshold, then you have the best possible sensitivity, specificity, positive and negative predictive value. Okay, so the, uh, just to make it more simple in terms of uh, jargon, what I would say to you is obviously the sensitivity of tryptase is uh, very high when you put your threshold very low, but that will compromise the, the, the performance of the test. Okay, so really what I would ask you to do is to adapt the equation 
in your clinic. I don't think our anesthetist colleagues need to worry about that too much because they are not going to be looking at the tryptase results. But whoever is doing the allergy clinic must be fully uh, you know, aware of this. So if you have the consensus equation in front of you and just put those values in, but that's all subject to having an accurate measurement. It's subject to having the proper timing to make sure that it's all within the half-life and all that. So those are the caveats. So if you if you are able to standardize your pathway that way, then if you if that goes above that threshold, then you know that anaphylaxis has occurred. Okay. Or I would say mast cell activation has occurred. Okay. Because some patients may not have had anaphylaxis, they would have had urticaria. Okay. Or they wouldn't have dropped their blood pressure, like in one of my cases. So, but having said that, it's always important to bear in mind that when tryptase is elevated, it is anaphylaxis. But when tryptase is not elevated, it does not exclude anaphylaxis. But I have to say that the chances of tryptase being elevated is very highly likely when a patient develops hypotension. Okay, that is applicable both in the context of perioperative and the context of community anaphylaxis. So when you have a drop in blood pressure, then the likelihood of tryptase being elevated is very high. Yes, we have another question. I think you answered that question adequately, asking whether uh, does tryptase levels differ between patients with hypotension versus pure respiratory symptoms? So I think you answered yes. that question. So, yeah, I think when you have pure respiratory symptoms, my experience is very unlikely you're going to have an elevated tryptase. Mm -hmm. um, so another problem that we face is sometimes uh, the patient turns up in our clinic uh, sometime later, I mean, a few years after the uh, the whatever the uh, anaphylaxis and then uh, when they want to undergo another surgery so now we have to give recommendations and we find that the patient uh, uh, might not be uh, uh, you know like uh, we don't know exactly what to test the patient for and uh, again uh, we don't know even if you test what the values would be um, so uh, Nadisha has asked whether you can suggest a safe, uh, least reactive NMB for a patient who had a past severe reaction during anesthesia but not been evaluated by an allergist. Yeah, so that's uh, that's uh, quite a, a challenging scenario and we do get that when someone presents to our clinic uh, 10, 15, 20 years after the index episode and there's no way you can get hold of what happened and they don't know what happened. They've just been told they've had anaphylaxis or something like anaphylaxis. So in that case, we uh, sort of... Uh, shape our approach to tailor the individual patient we explain to the patient what these uh, what the best practice is and the best practice is what we have been discussing over the last one hour so obviously their situation is very different so we go very pragmatic in such cases with a caveat that we don't have any information regarding the index event which means that the test results interpretation is going to be challenging and the limitations associated with that we document that in our notes and then we talk to the anesthetist and ask what procedure is being done for the patient. So if it's a GA, then I think there's a, I think our anesthetists will be very happy if you told them, yes, you can use propofol, you can use fentanyl, you can use rocuronium, and you can use penicillin or NSAIDs. You know, those are the things that they want to know. They want to know if they're allergic to latex. They want to know if they're allergic to chlorhexidine. So you can see that I've already given you a panel of tests. Okay. Now, I keep my fingers crossed when I, I have done that, hoping that they're all going to be negative. Okay. So if something is positive, uh, then uh, that doesn't mean clinical reactivity, but there's no way you're going to challenge the patient to rocuronium or to chlorhexidine or to latex. Latex you can, but you know, if the patient is telling you other things in the history that they are clinically tolerant to you know, latex condoms or, uh, you know, uh, latex balloons and things like that. But otherwise, you know, you can see that you've, you've got a panel uh, that will help the anesthetist to navigate that surgery, okay? And what you want to show is they're all clearly negative. And then what we also do is we do a baseline tryptase measurement to make sure that they don't have mastocytosis or, you know, that's well within normal range. So once that's all done, 
then then you have uh, then you can be confident. That's a good question. What's the negative predictive value of NMBA? It's very high. Fortunately, you know um, now I can't tell you it's hundred percent because there's never they say never say never in medicine. Okay, so I'm not going to put my head up the parapet and tell you it's hundred percent. So I will say it is not hundred percent, and I leave you to think about whether it's ninety nine point nine percent, ninety percent, or ninety five percent. I leave that to you. But I'm not going to commit myself to say it's hundred percent. So that's the game that is involved in the perioperative anaphylaxis. Is that if you want to maintain the yield of your tests, maximize the yield of your tests, then you have to follow the protocol to the letter. Okay, and then if you did that, then you will get it right. Okay, that's my experience over the last 15 to 20 years. Okay, so we have always adhered to the protocol, but we have a number of cases like the ones that you have just talked about. And even in those cases, you know, we, 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 we just put our hand up and accept the limitations. And we say that, okay, based on all the limitations, if you still want to go ahead with the surgery, these are the tests that we have done. They're all clearly negative. This very unlikely that the patient is going to have anaphylaxis. What we do say to the anesthetist is, if possible, administer it sequentially and not rapidly. So, for example, you know, you could ask them to give the antibiotic, you know, about half an hour before or something, right? Get a few drugs out of the way and then keep a limited panel of drugs for induction. So that's up to but the anesthetists are great at these things. You know, they are, they are able to, you know, they are able to uh, play to the situation so i think so that clear line of communication is really important i hope i have answered your question and um, dr rajiv has asked another question he has asked if all tests are negative including nmba uh, do you still go ahead with that yes with yeah. yes yes okay. um uh how cross-reactive, uh, what is the cross-reactive rate between atracurium and uh, vecuronium and rocuronium? Can you go I, ahead without testing or do you still no. have to test? No, we, we always test. There is some limited data in the literature, but then <clears throat> those cross-reactivity. Now, now, you know, you have to be very careful here. What do you mean by cross-reactivity? Here in cross-reactivity means someone having a positive test to multiple agents, including the index agent. So that doesn't mean cross reactivity. It also be it might be co sensitization, but <clears throat> we call it cross reactivity very loosely. Okay, but that's all we have got. So obviously we steer away from the ones that are positive, and we go to the ones that are clearly negative. And what I do is sometimes, <clears throat> if something's out borderline, I even do the test in triplicate to make sure that they're definitely negative, because sometimes there are human element when you do skin tests. You know, it depends on your exact experience and all that. Even the best of hands, sometimes there's variability, intraoperative variability. So therefore, in very high risk cases, sometimes I ask uh, our nurses to do it three times and show me the result. And that's when I say, okay, that's definitely negative. Um, I think I asked this question uh, before from you as well. So sometimes uh, the uh, due to the perioperative reactions, patient uh, the patient is not uh, able to complete the surgery or the, rather the doctors are not able to complete the surgery. So in that instance, when they come to us for testing, how soon do, uh, should you test them? Or is there like, I mean, generally we tend to uh, wait uh, as much as possible, uh, at least four weeks before we test. Um, what do you recommend? So, like I said to you a uh, uh, couple of weeks ago, uh, if it's an elective procedure, I would wait for even a couple of months, okay? Uh, I think people have always mentioned the four to six week mark. And if it's an urgent surgery, like cancer or critical uh, cardiac surgery or something, then I won't mess around. I would just go and do the tests. I'll start thinking about uh, all the caveats if the tests are negative, okay? Uh, because uh, the reason you're asking, just for the benefit of the audience, the reason you're asking that question is because some of the tests may be false negative in the immediate aftermath of the perioperative event, okay? And that is probably what, what we call as mast cell hyperresponsiveness or empty mast cell syndrome because the mast cells are tired, they've discharged all their granules, and it takes a while for them to fill up. That's in a very loose term, I would say, 
So we call it empty mast cell syndrome. I think it's a very loose uh, term for which there's not enough evidence. There are isolated case reports or case series. So therefore, given the lack of, uh, you know, strong evidence base, uh, I would, you know, cautiously proceed and not compromise um, the quality of care that you can give for a cancer patient because every day is important for them. And just for your fear of that false negative result, I would not sort of waste time. I would give them answers, but then I would put the relevant caveats. I would discuss it with the patient. I would discuss it with the anesthetist. And I think you will agree with me that the balance of risk will be in favor of doing the test and getting the patient through the procedure as swiftly and as safely as possible. Thank you. So I think uh, those are the implications that we have for the day. Um, so uh, I think this uh, the entire webinar has been quite useful and uh, we have received comments from the participants saying how useful it has been for them. And I think it's, it was especially useful uh, to us allergists also because sometimes it's very difficult for us to convince uh, the referring doctors to send all the details because they believe if the patient just turns up in our clinic that we will be able to solve their problems out for them. So um, thank you very much, Professor Krishna, for taking your time out of your busy schedule to uh, do this webinar uh, for us. And uh, uh, hopefully we can, if you have uh, any other requests, hopefully we can accommodate uh, some more webinars in the future, uh, probably. Sure. Uh, thank you very much once again, Professor Krishna. Thank you. Thank you for listening and thanks to everyone. It's been a great experience. Thank you. Okay.